one of the great freedoms Order, of freedom Senator of Bett, association. You will be in continuation upon resumption. Questions without notice, Senator Stirl. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Sadly, my question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Two days before Christmas last year, Lee received a call from her 86-year-old father's aged care home, Regis, Nedlands in Perth, telling her he was in an ambulance to the hospital. Her father, Brian Hunter, was, and I quote, slumped over in bed and his back was exposed. I could see his back was really terribly burnt. His whole back was burned and he was not speaking to us. He was semi in and out of consciousness. Brian, a double amputee who had lost both legs due to diabetes, had been left out on a rooftop terrace on a 40 degree day for two hours. Nobody noticed he was missing for two hours. Brian tragically died on the 20th of January this year, more than 12 months after the Royal Commission's interim report entitled Neglect. Minister, how is this neglect continuing on your watch? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Stirl for his question. Um, we are all very disturbed by any circumstance of uh, poor treatment, poor care of any resident in an aged care facility in this country, Mr. President. Uh, and, Mr. President, it should not keep happening. To, to your point, Senator, uh, Senator Watt, it should not keep happening. Uh, Mr. President, can I say I, I, I will be very cautious with respect to the allegations that are currently being aired with respect to Regis, because I know uh, that there are a number of investigations that are being undertaken with respect to the allegations that apply to this particular facility. Uh, I've had uh, quite a number of briefings uh, with respect to this from the Quality Commission and my department, and I've also had a number of conversations. Uh, elsewhere with respect to uh, this matter. And, Mr President, can I say um, I am very concerned that these allegations have come to light. There is a coroner's review that is underway, Mr President. There has been a police, a police investigation that has found no circumstance of criminality with respect to the allegations that are currently being aired with, in, in relation to Regis, Mr President. Uh, and, of course, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has issued both a sanction and a notice to agree against Regis Netherlands uh, with respect to the allegations that are being raised. Uh, all of these allegations, Mr. President, are very, very concerning. Uh, the government, members on this side, are just as concerned yeah. as anyone in any other part uh, on the chamber, Mr. President. Uh, we, are, we all remain concerned. About it. We are concerned for the families. Uh, and, and the circumstances that they find themselves in, and we would like to get to the Order. bottom of this matter Senator as much Colbeck. as anybody. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. The day after Brian's hospitalisation, the hospital reported Regis to the Morrison government's regulator, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Nobody visited Regis Nedlands until the 11th of January, three weeks later. When did the minister first become aware of Brian's tragic death, and what action has he taken to ensure this neglect never, ever happens again? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in, in relation to the specific date that I became aware of uh, the resident's death, I can't give you that specifically, but I'm happy to provide that information to the chamber, Mr. President. Uh, but as, I, as I've said, the, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has issued both a sanction and a notice to agree on uh, Regis Nedlands. Uh, that, that is an appropriate process. And Senator, I will take your intervention. You are right. It should not agree. It should not have occurred in the first place, Mr. President. Uh, and that, Mr. President, goes to well, that, Mr. President. Order. Mr. President, that's why we call the Royal Commission. That's why one of the first acts of Prime Minister Morrison was to call Order. a Royal Commission to undertake a forensic review of the aged care sector and so that we could put in place the reforms that will stop these sorts of events, lift the entire sector, uh, and so that we do have a better Order. and world-class aged care Senator system Stirl, in this country. A final supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Regis Netherlands had been sanctioned in November 2019, 14 months before Brian died, for putting the safety and health of residents at risk. How many more older Australians will tragically die because of the ongoing neglect in the Morrison government's aged care system? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, unfortunately, what Senator Stirl has done is neglected to advise the Chamber of other assessments of this organisation, who, you're correct, did receive a sanction at that point in time, but were subsequently assessed to be compliant with the standards. And so they had had a problem, they'd put in place corrective action to fix it and subsequently been assessed. Mr President, a sanction is not a life sentence. It is a process to improve the capacity of the service, Mr President, uh, and that's what I expect. That's what all of us expect should occur. And, Mr. President, that's what Order. I expect from Regis in the context Order. of the circumstances that are occurring right now, Mr. President. Regis Senator are currently McAllister. under both a sanction and a notice to agree, and both of those tools are designed to improve the quality of service at the facility. And, Mr. President, that is what I expect. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on the national COVID-19 vaccine rollout and how this is underpinning our health and economic recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Fawcett, for your question. Mr President, it has been an important week for all Australians. We are now into day four of the max the mass vaccine rollout across the country. We are prioritising the most vulnerable in society, as we should, to receive the vaccine first. Aged care residents, border quarantine and frontline health workers have the opportunity to have their first dose of the vaccine this week, Mr President. Both the Pfizer, BioNTech and the AstraZeneca vaccines require two separate doses for a person to be fully immunised. Pfizer BioNTech 21 days apart, AstraZeneca 12 weeks apart. Phase 1A remains on track for the first round of doses to be delivered within a six week period, Mr. President. Under the Australian Government's plan, quarantine and border workers and aged care residents are on track to be vaccinated by April. You can be assured that the vaccination rollout is well underway in your home state of South Australia. Senator Fawcett, I am advised that 933 people have had their first dose in South Australia, and we expect those figures to ramp up significantly as weeks progress. We thank all Australians, Mr. President, particularly the frontline health workers, for their commitment and hard work to rolling out this vaccine across the country. Our vaccination program will underpin our health and economic recovery. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister provide an update on how many Australians nationwide have been vaccinated in this first week of the rollout? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Fawcett. Mr. President, the aged care rollout is part of phase 1A. It will progressively ramp up as the week progresses. It's one of the things that we have asked the providers to do is to start cautiously to make sure that things are moving progressively. There have been more than 17,500 vaccines reported to the Commonwealth as having been administered across the country. So far this week, our vaccination teams have visited 71 residential aged care facilities and almost 4,700 residents have received the vaccine. We expect health care teams to visit an additional 20 facilities today and vaccinate a further 1,600 residents, Mr. President. In coming weeks, the program will reach more than 2,600 residential aged care facilities and more than 183,000 residents and 339,000 staff. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, could you outline what results are being seen around the world as a result of vaccination programs? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and thank you, Senator Fawcett. Data is coming in from around the world on other countries' vaccine rollouts. For example, there are very encouraging uh, results coming out of Scotland. 
Among Scotland's 5.4 million people, they've administered over 1 million doses of vaccine. They're using the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, as is Australia. Uh, Mr. President. And the study has looked at the numbers admitted to hospital with COVID, those that have had those and those that have not had the vaccines. Research led by Public Health Scotland found at four weeks after the first dose, hospital admissions were reduced by 85 per cent for the Pfizer vaccine and, Mr President, 94 per cent for AstraZeneca jabs. So these are very encouraging early results. Two leading vaccines that work against the severe end of the spectrum, and there's further evidence that it's working in a real-world setting, so very encouraging news. Order. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question today is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Lisa's father, 94-year-old Dick Lee, was allegedly abused at Regis Nedlands. A report details that he was found, and I quote, on the floor near the entrance of his room, completely unclothed and sitting in his faeces, with a carer standing over him. I asked the carer, did he fall? and the carer said no. The carer was later witnessed dragging Mr Lee into the bathroom. More than 12 months after the Royal Commission's interim report entitled Neglect, how is this neglect still continuing on this minister's watch? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Pratt, for the question. Um, Mr President, I will continue to be, in the answer to this question, uh, cautious with respect to what I say about the specifics of the allegations that have been made in this case, uh, as I was in the question from Senator Stirl. Uh, the, these cases are subject to coroner's inquests. They are subject to independent review processes that have been commissioned, and of course they have also uh, they have also been, Order. Mr. President, subject to a police investigation. Mr. President, Order. Uh, what I will say is that nobody in this place wants to see mistreatment of any senior Australia Order. resident Order. in aged care in this country. That is why we called the Royal Senator Commission Watt. to into uh, aged care quality and safety, so that we could conduct a comprehensive review of the sector and Order that we could put in place the appropriate regulatory regimes that support high-quality care for all senior Australians in Order. the country. Mr President, I'll take the, the interjection from the other side, Mr President, because at the, at, the last, at the last budget, when we put billions of dollars into aged care, what did the opposition put in respect of aged care in Order. their budget reply? Not a single dollar, Mr. President. Order. They, they, Order. A lot of Senator crocodile Colbeck. tears. A lot have, of crocodile tears on I the have other Senator side, Mr. President. But they have done nothing for I, decades. Senator Colbeck, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. I didn't hear anything unparliamentary. Senator Wong is on her feet. And to get into withdrawals, we also have crocodile tears, which impugns what we are asking when we're asking about neglect. But I don't propose to go down that path. I'm raising an issue of direct relevance. Uh, this minister is asked, not. I'm sorry. I Order. I can't. Order. Senator Wong has got the call. Interjections the, the, the are Senator always disorderly and particularly unhelpful. Feet. I missed something completely. Senator Wong on the point of order. Let's... No, I order. don't actually. I just want to make order. my point. Mr. President, we're asking questions about some very serious uh, allegations. There is one question that the minister has been asked, which is how is the neglect continuing on his watch more than 12 months after he's received the Royal Commission report? I'd ask you to remind him of the question. Um, Senator Wong, um, I believe the minister was being directly relevant and then, and then responded to interjections, which was not being directly relevant. Um, I will remind the minister of the question. I'll also remind people not to interject and therefore the distraction and the opportunity won't occur. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, and of course, with respect to the interim report of the Royal Commission, uh, and of course the COVID-19 report of the Royal Commission, the government has responded to both of those reports. 
we have continued to reform the sector, passing new legislation which places additional responsibilities on the sector. The Serious Incident Response Scheme, which was passed through this uh, place only last week, Mr. President. So we have continued to reform the sector, um, as, a, as while the Royal Commission has continued, and we will order. continue to do so. Sorry, Senator, Senator Birmingham, on a point of order. Uh, Mr. President, make a point of order in relation to conduct in the chamber and interjections. Senator Wong, in making her point of order before, demanded complete silence in the chamber before she spoke. And yet, since Senator Colbeck got back on his feet, Senator Wong has shown nothing but lack of courtesy in listening to that answer and showing double standard in relation to the behaviour that she expected when she was on her feet. All interjections are disorderly. Order. I, I, I'm going to ask that people at least stop the interjections while I talk. It's the end of a fortnight. I'm going to ask people to restrain themselves. I was attempting to call the chamber to order. I will start raising my voice if I need to, but interjections are not helpful and they are disorderly. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. A few days after the alleged neglect, Mr. Lee became ill, and his daughter's concerns that something was seriously wrong were dismissed. Mr. Lee was eventually rushed to hospital, where he was in a coma, had liver failure, and he died the next day. So I ask, when did the minister first become aware of Mr. Lee's tragic death, and what action has he taken to ensure this neglect never happens again? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say it is really um, th this whole matter is, and, and the allegations that surround it are extremely distressing, distressing for us all. But can I say the matter is not helped by questions from the opposition that leave that, that, that leave that leave Order. out vital Order. facts that are a part of Order. this case, Mr. President. That leave out Senator vital Colbeck, facts. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. I can't hear the minister's answer. I need to be able to hear it. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, it is really disappointing that the opposition leaves out vital elements of uh, what was even in the media this morning as part of their question uh, to cast an impression that actually isn't true. Mr. President, the, the, the gentleman concerned was attended by a GP. The gentleman concerned was attended by a GP. This was not an active aged care facility. So for the Labor Party to come in here and try and create the impression that it was is quite frankly completely dishonest. And I've been very, very careful with respect to the circumstances and the detail Order. that I put Senator on the Colbeck table with respect the to these things. And I'd ask the Senator, Senator Pratt, a, a final supplementary Many question. older Australians in residential aged care have died this year as a result of neglect. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, every person in this chamber would abhor any circumstance where a senior Australian has had that circumstance occur. Every single, every single one of us would have, done, would, would have uh, that view. That is why this government, that is why this government called the Royal Commission, because we want to reform this sector in a way that provides high quality care to senior Australians. Order. That is our objective, Senator, Senator Colbeck. Senator Gallagher on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Point of order on relevance. Um, the question was very direct. Um, there was no preamble. It was how many Australians have, in residential aged care have died this year as a result of neglect. Um, I'd ask the minister to come to the question, answer of the question. Quite right, Senator Gallagher. Um, I have previously ruled that where there is a specific question that relates to the search for a fact, directly relevant, will be applied very, very tightly. I call the minister to turn to the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, there, there, there have been, over the, the course of the last 12 months, um, a number of allegations of neglect in aged care, and we're dealing with some of those as a part of the questions that we're being asked today. Mr President, well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, Senator Polly interjects and says that they're more than allegations, but can I say that's exactly what they are? They are allegations at this point in time, Mr. Order. President. Order, Senator and, Colbeck. And I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator, I'll, I'll call Senator Wong when senators on my left give her an opportunity to be heard. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I repeat, Senator Gallagher's point of order. Um, yes, this was a specific factual question that 
for, for which an answer can be provided or a discussion of the topic in question. Um, I have previously ruled that where there is no preamble or commentary or politically contestable terms, that questions need to be taken strictly at their face value. So, Minister, I remind you of the question, Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, I have allegations of people who may have died of neglect, but I have no direct evidence of anyone who has died Order. of neglect. Senator Colbeck, thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. In an extreme act of violence, an Aboriginal woman and her baby were attacked by a Nazi with a flamethrower this week. Why hasn't the Prime Minister had anything to say about this? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks Mr President, and, uh, and I thank Senator Thorpe for her question. Uh, I am aware um, uh, of an investigation by WA Police into a reported assault. Um, I have heard media commentary uh, along the lines of, uh, of that which you have described, uh, Senator Thorpe. Um, let me make very clear, if those uh, facts are true, um, then of course they are to completely and utterly be condemned. Uh, they are shameful. All forms of hatred and division are unacceptable and should be condemned, and I have no doubt uh, Sorry, the Senator Prime Thorpe Minister— Sorry, uh, Senator Thorpe, on a point of order. Senator Thorpe. Uh, relevant, uh, President, my question is why hasn't the Prime Minister said anything, or the so-called leader of this country? Um, Senator Thorpe, um, I, the minister has been speaking for 39 seconds. Um, he was discussing directly the first part of the question, which I think is directly relevant. I've allowed you to restate the second part of the question, but I believe he's being directly relevant by addressing the facts that you outlined at the, at the context for your question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. As, as I was mid-sentence saying, I have no doubt the Prime Minister would share my condemnation of the events, the horror of all Australians. Order. Order. Order would share the condemnation, I am sure, of all fair-thinking Australians of the events. Senator Thorpe, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This government's silence is violence. Why does this government condone these attacks by saying nothing, which just means you contribute to the problem? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I reject the question entirely. The government in no way condones such horrific events and unreservedly condemns them. Order. Order. I'll call, I'll call Senator Thorpe when there's silence. Senator Thorpe, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What are you doing about these white nationalist terrorists, if these terrorists were anything other than white, you would have moved heaven and earth to find them. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, the government rejects extremism in all of its forms, including right-wing extremism Order. or any other. Order. Our Order. increase in funding and support, our increase in funding and support for agencies such as ASIO to be able to respond to extremism, Order. enables enables the security agencies, as they have done, to identify the rise in different types of extremism, including the rise in right-wing extremism. The government has funded the agencies to do that work because we know that it needs effective law enforcement and intelligence activities to respond to it. That's why we've taken that action. It's why we support that work of our agencies, and we will continue to do so regardless of whatever type of extremism it relates to. Order. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. The Respect at Work report was delivered almost a year ago. In his speech at the International Women's Day breakfast this morning, 
Mr Morrison said, and I quote, my hope is that we will live in a society where we can truly say that women are respected, because from the disrespect of women, all the other challenges flow. It starts with the failure of respect for women. Can the minister explain why the Attorney General, Mr Porter, has sat on the Respect at Work report for almost a year without implementing a single substantive legislative recommendation? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, just to clarify, Senator McAllister, I believe you asked me as Minister for Women, but I do also represent the Attorney General uh, in this place. As the Senator has, uh, has indicated, this government commissioned the Respect at Work report into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces, uh, which, as the Senator has indicated, was tabled by the government last year. Sexual harassment in Australian workplaces, which of course has been uh, in its most uh, appalling, uh, in its most appalling representation, uh, the subject of significant discussion in this place in the last weeks. It is an issue that can affect any workplace, and so the report by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner uh, and her team uh, is a very important uh, report, which needs, we believe a unified national response from all Australian governments as well as from employers and industry. So as part of the budget, uh, last budget, 2021, including in the 2020 Women's Economic Security Statement, the government announced uh, $2.1 million over three years to provide practical support to employers and employees to prevent and address sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. That funding will contribute uh, towards the implementation of key recommendations from the AHRC's landmark report. Uh, and that includes uh, the council itself, which will be led by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins, will bring together existing leaders from bodies with a role in preventing and responding to workplace sexual harassment. The council will work to promote safer workplaces and provide high-level advice Payne, to I the government. Senator have Senator McAllister on a point of order. Senator McAllister. Uh, I have been listening to the answer, but my point of order goes to relevance. I asked specifically about the failure to implement a substantive, any of the substantive legislative recommendations. I'd like the minister to address that part of the question, which was a narrow question. I've uh, allowed you to remind the minister of the question. I, I think it is in order and being directly relevant for the minister to be discussing other measures the government has taken, and that is a, an opportunity that can be debated after question time as to uh, the Senate's consideration of those answers. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I was referring to the recommendation in relation to the Council, which will be led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. That funding through the budget will also support the implementation of nine other key recommendations from the report, including uh, the development of the Order. online information Payne, platform— time for the answer has expired. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The Australian Human Rights Commission has recommended the amendment of the Sex Discrimination Act to, and I quote, introduce a positive duty on employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sex discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation. Will the Morrison government amend the Sex Discrimination Act to reflect this recommendation? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The uh, government is, as I was uh, saying, Mr President, considering the recommendations of the report. It was a very wide-ranging report, and deliberately so, uh, Mr President. It considered matters that are relevant to business, to industry, to independent agencies, to e education providers, to state and territory governments and to the Commonwealth. I referred to the online information platform, Mr President, which is recommendation 48, recommendations 9, 34, 36, 37, 40 and 50. Concerning the, uh, the package of training Senator and education resources. Point of order. Senator McAllister. Yes, my point of order is relevance. Um, the question went to a specific recommendation made by the Australian Human Rights Commission. I've asked the minister, will the government be implementing that recommendation? I have not asked about the other recommendations in the report. Um, you've reminded the minister of the question, and again I remind ministers that where there is a very specific question, and I do consider this question relatively specific in nature, uh, referring to a recommendation, I believe I, is the language I caught, um, that their comments should be addressed to matters that are directly relevant to that particular issue. Senator Payne to continue. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I believe I still had uh, half of my time available to me to respond to the Senator's question. Uh, I was referring to those other recommendations and recommendation two in relation to a 2022 survey, a specific recommendation to evaluate the effectiveness of these new measures to track levels of sexual harassment. The government is considering the other recommendations, including the one that Senator McAllister has referred to, uh, and will respond in due course. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thank you. When launching the Respect at Work report, the minister said, and I quote, I take these recommendations very seriously and I'm committed to ensuring that sexual harassment is eradicated from workplaces in this country. A year on, with not a single substantive legislative recommendation implemented, what is the minister doing to deliver on this commitment? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have already alluded to the recommendations uh, in the report that were taken up in the Women's Economic Security Statement in October last year, the specific recommendations that I actually don't think Senator McAllister wanted to hear about, those specific recommendations that are being pursued through that process. The Attorney General, who, uh, with whom I work on these matters, and now welcome very much the opportunity to work with my colleague, Senator Stoker. Uh, who has specific portfolio responsibility in this area with the Attorney-General as the Assistant Minister. Uh, we met uh, indeed uh, in this parliamentary sitting, uh, Mr President, to discuss these issues. It's a matter the government takes very seriously. There were, as I said, I think 50, uh, 55 recommendations uh, uh, in total, 20 to the for the Commonwealth Government, uh, another four that uh, did propose to the Respect at Work Council, 12 that are shared between the Commonwealth and state and territory governments, uh, 13 for government agencies and regulators, three for education providers and three for business and industry. It's a whole of government, whole of community, Order. whole of Senator Australia Payne. responsibility, Time Mr President. And we are Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy, Senator Sezelja. Minister, the Western Australian Liberal National Party opposition has committed to shut down Western Australian coal power by 2025. In the place of reliable baseload coal power will be $16 billion of wind and solar power. The role of maintaining backup power into the entire Western Australian grid when wind and solar fail, as they inevitably do, will fall on a battery. Minister, can you please explain to the House how Western Australia's 2,500 megawatts of average daily power use can be met by a battery and how many calm, rainy days in a row will put the entire state into a blackout? The Minister for Energy and Emissions, representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Roberts for the question. Uh, in terms of the detail of the Western Australian uh, Liberal opposition's uh, policy, I can't speak to the absolute detail of that, so I could take some of that on notice. Uh, but when it comes to but when it comes to energy security uh, and the need to take action, uh, our government, of course, has laid its priorities on the table. And so uh, those priorities, of course, Order. include a, a strong focus on reliable and affordable energy. And whether that's uh, with our plans when it comes to gas, uh, whether that's in record investment in renewables, uh, whether that is in extending uh, the life of other uh, baseload power, whether that is in Snowy Hydro 2.0, uh, whether that is the work we are doing with the battery for the Order. nation. Uh, we have a proud record of ensuring uh, that we have reliable and affordable power whilst investing in renewable energy, meeting our emissions reductions targets on an international scale uh, and creating jobs and supporting manufacturing. But in terms of the detail of uh, some of those policies you go to, I'm happy to take those on notice. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, the Liberal National's plan is to build 4,500 megawatts of wind and solar to replace the 1,050 megawatts of baseload power that coal provides. What is the reliability factor of wind and solar? Because this policy puts wind and solar deliverability at just 23 per cent of rated capacity. Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much. And again, going to the detail of that policy, I'm happy to take some of that on notice. Uh, but it, there is no doubt uh, that when it comes to delivering on these policies, we have made it very, very clear over a period of time uh, that wind and solar and renewables, uh, and of course we've got record investment in renewables uh, in Australia at the moment, uh, they are very important, but you do uh, need to ensure you have baseload capacity. Uh, to ensure that uh, we don't see the kind of uh, 
situation that we saw under the former Labor government in South Australia, uh, where, where the lights are going out, where electricity is not being delivered. Uh, Order. Well, well, no, th thank, you Order. For the, thank you for the interjection, Senator Wong. It, it, is, it is true that uh, the only statewide blackout that I'm aware of in recent times did happen in South Australia under the watch of the South Australian Labor government. Uh, but when it comes to actual investment in energy, uh, it is absolutely Order. important. And I'll, just, I'll just state it again. I'll just state it again. Uh, Order, I've run Senator out of time. Sanjay. I might do it on the next sub. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. President. Thank you. Minister, how many workers will lose their jobs from the coal industry in Western Australia as a result of this Liberal National Party policy? Senator, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, th I, thank, I thank Senator Roberts for the question and again going to the detail of that policy. Uh, without having read that particular policy document, it would be impossible for me to comment uh, one way or another. But what I can tell you uh, is that our Liberal National Government uh, has been focused on ensuring that we are growing jobs in the economy, bringing job back, jobs back as we recover from COVID, investing in our energy resources so we can support a strong manufacturing sector, uh, whether that is in our technology focus, whether that is in our focus on gas, whether that is in, in our investment in renewables, whether that is in extending the life of power stations, whether that is in areas like Snowy Hydro 2.0. We have a comprehensive policy uh, that supports energy, relies and affordable energy. We are bringing prices down. Uh, that supports a viable manufacturing industry, amongst other industries. Uh, that's our record. That's what we're going to continue to fight for, to bring back jobs and support reliable and affordable energy. Senator Small. Thanks, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. With the vaccine rollout underway and continuing signs of economic recovery across the country, can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic supports through COVID-19 have helped small businesses to ride out the crisis and Australians to stay in jobs? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I uh, thank Senator Small for the question and again acknowledge to the Chamber Senator Small's background in particular as being a small business owner back in our home state of Western Australia and the fact that he really understands what it's like uh, to build a business for scratch, from scratch, to employ people, you know, to pay wages and to certainly have sleepless nights. And Mr President, as we now know in Australia, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is underway and so is Australia's economic recovery. According to the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics Labor Force Statistics for January, we've seen a net increase in jobs of 29,000. And that, of course, came off the back of the creation of 59,000 full-time jobs. We've also seen, as Senator Payne notes, uh, women's workforce participation return to the near record levels it was prior to the pandemic. Underemployment is now falling. And as we know, over 93% of the jobs lost during COVID-19 have now returned back to the economy. Mr President, all of this, all of this has been possible because of the support that the Morrison government has provided uh, to, in particular, you know, small and family businesses across Australia. Uh, we put in place policies that have kept Australians uh, in work because we put in place the policies that kept businesses in business. These, of course, included JobKeeper, apprentice and trainee, wage subsidies, the cash flow boost that of course gave people back their own hard-earned money, the SME guarantee scheme, the early withdrawal of superannuation. We put in place a suite of policies and this suite of policies have all played a vital role. In fact, when you look at the uh, RBA research, it estimates that JobKeeper saved over 700,000 jobs in the first half of 2020. Uh, Mr President, in our Supporting Apprentices and Trainee Wage Subsidy, it's now supported over 59,000 small businesses to keep 119,000 apprentices on the job where we need Order, them to Senator be. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister, can you outline how the labour market has, has responded to the tapering of JobKeeper and other COVID-19 economic supports implemented by the Morrison government? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as I've said, we've seen now 93 per cent, or around 93 per cent, 
of the jobs that were lost as a result of COVID-19 return back to the economy. And what we are seeing is that the transition to the second phase of JobSeeker has been successful. And what it is doing is ensuring that support is targeted to those who need it most. In fact, between September and December of 2020, we saw the level of economic support fall by $30 billion. At the same time the support was tapered, the economy added 320,000 jobs. New analysis of tax microdata by Treasury shows that the number of phase two JobKeeper workers who are working zero or very low hours has now been decreasing over time. But what we've also seen is record numbers of previously unemployed people finding new jobs. And in fact, Mr President, uh, to November 2020, we saw a record of 170,000 unemployed Small, people into the workforce. final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. As the original COVID-19 supports begin to conclude, how will the Morrison government continue to support small business through the jobs recovery over the course of 2021? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as the Prime Minister has always said, our number one priority as a government is getting Australians back into work, keeping businesses in business and getting Australians back into work. We, of course, have our $74 billion job maker plan. That is, as you know, it's supporting employers to hire, to bring on additional people into their workplace. We're supporting Australians to train, to upskill, to reskill. And of course, we're supporting hardworking small business owners to grow their own business. Our economic support measures have boosted family and business balance sheets. We now see over $200 billion extra in savings over the last year. We're also unlocking confidence to spend that money, which is a good thing, particularly in our small businesses. And as we know, small businesses, they are the backbone of the Australian economy, uh, and we need to do everything that we can to support them. We know that there's a long road ahead, uh, but we are committed to boosting the confidence of Australians and, of course, ensuring that Australians Order, remain Senator in work. Order, Senator Cash. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. Minister, the US government sought extradition of Australian citizen Julian Assange from the UK for espionage. Espionage is a political offence for which extradi extradition is expressly barred from the US-UK extradition treaty. Minister, given the political nature of extradition, have you personally made representations to the incoming Biden administration to drop the US appeal against the UK court decision to not extradite Mr Assange? And if not, will you? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Rice for her question. Senator Rice, as I I believe I have advised the chamber previously. Uh, I have raised the situation of Mr Assange uh, with my previous United States counterpart, former Secretary of State uh, Pompeo. I have not uh, yet met with uh, Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken, uh, but I am sure that in the course of uh, such a meeting that this matter would be raised. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Um, Minister, my question is, you know, basically, will you commit to picking up the phone to be asking the US administration to drop the charges against Mr Assange? Um, Minister, there were reports that the Trump administration in the latter days of the Trump term was close to pardoning Assange and may have done so if they had received representations from the Australian government. Will you pick up the phone to the incoming Biden administration? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I again have previously advised the Chamber, Mr Assange is subject to a legal process uh, in another country. Australia does not interfere in the legal processes of other countries and has long held that position across multiple governments. Uh, as we would not expect other governments to, to interfere in legal processes in our country. Mr Assange is currently the subject of a United States appeal against the decision of the British courts uh, that he is ineligible for extradition due to uh, the court forming a view in relation to a risk of self-harm in the US prison. That appeal was lodged on the 12th of February. I don't intend to provide a running commentary on the details of the case, as it is before the courts. We, consider, we continue to monitor Mr Assange's case closely, as we do for Australians in detention overseas. 
Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Minister, when is enough enough? Julian Assange has suffered so much, and the judge in the UK case has basically said that extradition to the US is effectively a death sentence. The, US, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has said that the failure of the judgment to denounce and redress the persecution and torture of Mr Assange leaves fully intact intact the in intended intimidating effect on journalists and whistleblowers. So it's, is it the Australian government's position that extraditing Order. Julian Senator Assange Rice, to the US is acceptable? Time for the question has expired. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, members of my office and of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade met with Mr Assange's legal team uh, in this uh, sitting period to discuss a range of matters, including the matter of Mr Assange. This government has sought, through our consular uh, officials and through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the High Commission uh, in Britain, to support Mr Assange in an appropriate consular fashion in any way we could. We have done that by seeking his consent to discuss any prison condition issues with prison officials to offer him consular assistance. We have done that on 21 separate, time, separate occasions. On 21 separate occasions, no response has been received to that correspondence Order. from Mr Assange or Senator from Wish his Wilson. representatives. Uh, the Wish government Wilson. has endeavoured to provide him with that appropriate support. We will Senator continue Wish to do that. He withdrew consent for us to consult in relation to any of his circumstances, his health or his welfare, in 2019. We have continued to raise Order, with Senator UK Payne. government Senator officials Wish our time expectations for the answer has of how expired. Senator Wish Wilson. I called you to order and you kept interjecting while I was doing so. Please cease. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. This morning, the Home Affairs Minister claimed he is not allowed to disclose information provided to him by the Australian Federal Police. But he also admitted to breaking that rule and providing information to the Prime Minister's office about Brittany Higgins' case on February 12. Who in the Prime Minister's office received that official information and at what time was it received? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, I thank the Senator for the question. Um, I understand that the Minister for Home Affairs has been asked this question in the House, uh, but the information that, again, I have before me uh, that I can provide you with is uh, basically what I've said, stated yesterday. AFP Commissioner Kershaw first advised Minister Dutton of Ms Higgins' allegations on Thursday, the 11th of February, 2021. This was the first time the minister had been advised of Ms Higgins' allegations. Uh, as I advised yesterday, he received further updates from Commissioner Kershaw during last week and this week. Uh, he was advised that his office was not aware of Ms Higgins' allegations prior to his briefing from Commissioner Kershaw on the 11th of February 2021. Uh, and again, I think, as I stated yesterday, uh, as senators would know, the handling of allegations and investigation of criminal conduct, including briefing to ministers, uh, is a matter for the AFP. Uh, further information that I can provide, uh, the minister, as the minister responsible for the AFP has stated that he regularly receives confidential briefings from the Commissioner. He has a responsibility to protect the integrity of investigations and the information discussed in these briefings. Uh, he has stated that it was his judgment that he should not disclose the information provided to him, as this was an ongoing operational matter. I understand he's also advised that his Chief of Staff contacted the Prime Minister's office the next day on the 12th of February following the receipt of media inquiries. And that's the information that I have before me. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. At any time, was this minister aware of any estimates briefing being prepared in relation to the events of the night of 22-23 March 2019? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I've referred to Mr Dutton's evidence uh, that he has advised that his office was not aware of Ms Higgins' allegations prior to his briefing from Commissioner Kershaw on the 11th of February 2021, and also his evidence that the AFP Commissioner Kershaw first advised him 
of Ms Higgins' allegations on Thursday, the 11th of February, 2021, and as such, that was the first time he was advised of Ms Higgins' allegations. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. In October 2019, the minister left a message from Ms Higgins saying, and I quote, Daniel has got everything under control, I promise you. At that time, Senator Cash was the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs in the Senate. What did Daniel have under control? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, Senator Walsh, I actually responded to that question uh, when Senator Watt asked it of me, and I would refer you back to that answer. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister outline what the government is doing to deliver on Australia's commitment to provide COVID-19 vaccines to our neighbours in Southeast Asia and Minute the Pacific? Sorry, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, thank Senator Betts uh, for his question. Mr. President, Australia's security, our safety, and our prosperity are intertwined with those in our region. We are working in close partnership with our neighbours to implement our over $500 million regional vaccine access initiative and our $80 million contribution to the COVAX facilities fund for developing countries. That fund began its first delivery of vaccines yesterday to protect some of the world's most vulnerable people. We're consulting with 18 partner countries across the Pacific and Southeast Asia to align their national vaccine deployment plans and to directly address their priorities. Our support is deliberately end-to-end, -end. so we're providing technical advice to support the rollout of vaccines under the COVAX facility. We have already assisted Vanuatu, Kiribati, Samoa and Tonga in this way. In particular, we're supporting Tonga to develop and implement a new national vaccination register. We're deploying Australian specialists to work with these partner governments. Our National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance is deploying a specialist to Timor-Leste to support preparations for their national rollout. Australia's Therapeutic Goods Administration is providing advice to our partners, which is critical in building that trust in the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Our support includes identifying target populations for early vaccinations, developing public health materials, strengthening cold chain and medical supply management, and establishing monitoring and evaluation arrangements. For example, we'll shortly be training Solomon Islands epidemiologists in data collection and analysis. My Indonesian counterpart, Retno Marsudi, and I have agreed a strong package of support for Indonesia to procure vaccines and to provide technical assistance. I also discussed uh, our support with uh, Secretary uh, Loxon, Teddy Loxon, the Foreign Secretary of the Philippines this week uh, as well. This is a program which is meeting the pledges that Australia has made to support our shared regional recovery from the pandemic. Order. Senator Abetz, a supplementary question. I thank the minister for that very interesting answer and ask, will the minister advise what the government is doing to coordinate with our partners on this vaccination program. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. And co cooperation with our partners is absolutely critical. By coordinating our efforts with New Zealand, with the US and with France, we will cover the vaccination needs of the Pacific. And this is a matter which the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Sir Selger, and I have been engaging on with counterparts across the region. We're talking with other potential suppliers, including India and Japan. We're working with the World Health Organization, with UNICEF, with multilateral development banks, the Pacific Island Forum, the Pacific Community, and with ASEAN to ensure support that meets international standards. We'll purchase vaccines through organisations such as UNICEF and we'll share vaccines from our own supply pipeline with both the Pacific and Timor-Leste. We're also vice chair of the Gavi board, Mr President, and through that we've negotiated to ensure all eligible Pacific Island countries are covered by the COVAX facility, which will deliver over one million doses to the Pacific and Timor-Leste by the middle of this year. Senator Abetz, a final supplementary question. Will the minister explain how this important initiative will deliver improved regional health security and economic recovery? 
Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. This is a very important question from Senator Rebetz because vaccination is a critical public health measure to take control of COVID-19, to end the pandemic and to ensure recovery. So timely access to safe and effective vaccines will improve our regional health security and also reduce burdens on regional health systems. It will pave the way, importantly, for the reopening of borders, for re-establishing transport routes and restarting economies. It will boost critical sectors, including seasonal work, so important to our region, international tourism, vital to our region, and a range of agricultural industries that depend on the availability of regular international transport services. It's important that our region works together to vaccinate populations, to bring about that shared economic recovery. We will ensure that we support our neighbours in this process and that we deliver on our COVID-19 development program pivot on partnerships for recovery. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, following COVID vaccine overdose, overdoses by a doctor in Queensland, the Minister for Health and Aged Care claimed, and I quote, the specific training of this Australian trained doctor were all carried out in accordance with procedures, and every one of those steps has been checked and rechecked, and none of those steps had been breached. He and this minister were then forced to correct the record, advising the doctor had not completed the required training. Why has the minister let this rollout commence in aged care homes without ensuring that everyone administering the vaccinations had the required training? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and Mr President, uh, both the Minister for Health and Aged Care and myself believed that it was important that we put on the public record as quickly as possible uh, the information that we had available to us with respect to uh, the circumstances that occurred at the aged care facility in Queensland, Mr President. We were assured, we were assured by the Deputy Chief Health of Medical Officer uh, that by Healthcare Australia that the, that the uh, doctor involved had in fact undertaken the required training. Uh, we were subsequently advised on further investigation and inquiry that that had not been the case, Mr President. So what we have done is taken specific action to ensure, via our own circumstances, that every worker working through and working on the uh, vaccine rollout in aged care across the country is independently ordered by us. Mr President, I think it's very, very the Labor should be very cautious about the language that they're using with respect to this matter, Mr. President. They should be very, very cautious. Order. They are contributing, Order. Mr. President. The Labor Party are contributing with their language Order. to an undermining of the confidence in the vaccination process Order. across the country, Mr. President. Their language is directly, their language is directly contributing to the undermining of the confidence in the vaccination process across this country, Mr. President, which we all Order. agree is absolutely vital, Mr. President. Absolutely vital that we maintain confidence in Order the vaccination process left. around the country, Mr. President. And I'm very pleased to note Senator that Ayers. the acceptance rate, the con confirmation rate of residents in aged care facilities around the country remains high. It remains high, which is exactly what we want, because, Mr. President, we want senior Australians Order. protected Senator Colbeck, by the application Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has vaccine. expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Did the general pr practitioner who was responsible for the overdoses have conditions on his registration? If so, why were these conditions permitted under the contract entered into by the Morrison government? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I'll have to take the specifics of any details Order, in relation Ayers. to the doctor Senator Gallagher. concerned on notice, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, my advice is that it wasn't Order. a general—he's not a general practitioner, he's, he's a doctor. Uh, my advice is that he's not a general practitioner. Order, Senator Gallagher. Mr President, and so I will take any, any specifics in relation to this. The doctor— the doctor was an Australian-trained doctor. 
uh, but I will take any specifics of any conditions that he may have had. Uh, there is currently an investigation being undertaken by the Defe Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Michael Kidd, into the circumstances of this case. Once that information is available to me, Mr. President, I'm very happy to provide it to the Chamber. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. What clinical governance has the government put in place to ensure everyone administering COVID vaccines is properly and fully trained? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I indicated in my previous uh, first answer, uh, the Australian government is taking an independent audit across all of those people who are working on the vaccine rollout into aged care in the country, independent of the processes that exist within the organisations that are taking that are taking out the rollout. Uh, we have also asked the former chief nurse and midwifery officer to be a part of the Healthcare Australia, uh, be, be embedded into Healthcare Australia. So we are undertaking our own independent oversight to ensure that all of those who, have, who are participating in the rollout are pro appropriately qualified and trained. Senator Birmingham. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, I also just wish to add a little information to the answer I gave in relation to the question from Senator Thorpe. Uh, I am advised that earlier this week uh, the Minister for Home Affairs, Mr Dutton, uh, reposted a statement from West Australian Police. He did so adding his own comments and the Minister for Home, Affair, Home Affairs stating that and I quote, very disturbing reports out of WA. The actions of this individual as reported are disgraceful and have no place in our society. Anyone with information should contact the police. Thank you, I Minister. Thank the Senate. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Stuhl and Pratt. Well, this morning as I was leaving home and listening to the news, as many of us do, I was shocked to yet again hear new allegations of extreme neglect in aged care facilities in our country. New allegations have come to light concerning severe neglect of elderly Australians in the Regis Nedlands aged care facility in Perth. And the details of those allegations, as they have come to light, despite how many times we have heard these sorts of things occurring on this government's watch, still were appalling and shocking. Two days before Christmas last year, on a 40-degree day, Lee received a call from her 86-year-old father's aged care home, Regis Nedlands in Perth, telling her he was in an ambulance to the hospital. Her father, Brian, was, and I quote, slumped over in the bed and his back was exposed. I could see his back was t really terribly burnt. His whole back was burned and he was not speaking to us. He was semi in and out of consciousness. Brian, a double amputee, had been left out on the rooftop terrace for two hours. Nobody knew where he was for two hours. And tragically, Brian died on the 20th of January this year. There were further allegations concerning the Regis Nedlands facility as well. In the days before Brian Hunter's death, Six nursing, home, nursing students were sent to Regis Nedlands for their first clinical placement, where they witnessed abuse, widespread neglect, rough handling and sexually inappropriate behaviour. One of the abused residents was 94-year-old Mr Lee. The report details that one of the students found, and I quote, Mr Lee, who is always in a wheelchair, on the floor near the entrance of his room, completely unclothed and sitting in his faeces with a carer standing over him. The nurse, nursing student said that she asked the carer, did he fall? And the carer replied with no. The student later witnessed the carer dragging Mr Lee to the bathroom. It is terribly sad and shocking that we continue to hear stories like that emanating from aged care facilities around the country. And they are only two of the stories that have emerged this week alone. For years now, we have been bringing to the attention of the Senate the, exactly these sorts of stories, 
and we have been getting exactly the same kind of answers to our questions that we saw from Senator Colbeck today. We get the fake concern, we get the this shouldn't be happening to anyone, we get the I'm as appalled as anyone, and there's just one fact that Senator Colbeck and his predecessors continue to omit from their explanations, and that is that they have every power required to actually do something about this and fix this system so that we don't keep seeing and hearing these types of stories. You would think, listening to Senator Colbeck, whether it be today or last time we asked him questions or last year when we repeatedly brought these kinds of stories to the uh, chamber's attention, you would think that Senator Colbeck is just some innocent bystander, as appalled as the rest of us by what is going on. He is probably you're right, Senator Polly. He is probably the one person in this chamber and in this government who can actually do something about it. The clue is in Senator Colbeck's title, Minister for Aged Care Services. Senator Colbeck has every opportunity to do something about this, and he has repeatedly been warned about the huge systemic problems in our aged care services due partly to this government's lack of funding and due even more so to the funding cuts that this government has imposed, particularly while the now, now Prime Minister was the Treasurer of this country. I'm getting pretty sick and tired of hearing Senator Colbeck and other members of this government continue to stand there and, and empathise and express concern and say that we none of us want to see this when they actually could be doing something to fix this. Now, we do have a Royal Commission underway. And tomorrow, I understand the government will be receiving the final report of that Royal, Com Royal Commission. But several months ago, the government received an interim report from this Royal Commission titled Neglect, if there was any doubt about what is going on in our aged care system. And still, despite a Royal Commission report, we still continue to see and hear these stories. The fact is that this government just doesn't care about what's going on in our aged care facilities. They just don't care that elderly Australians are being neglected, are being treated like this, when they deserve all of our support in their, in their twilight years. This government has had every chance to fix it, and they just thank keep you, ignoring Senator it. Senator Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. And look, I, I thank Senator Watt for um, bringing our notice to this issue. Um, the allegations are absolutely abhorrent, and Senator Watt is quite correct, that we shouldn't hear about um, allegations of neglect uh, in our aged care system. And indeed, our government is working to improve the system. Um, it is difficult. We have a large and extensive you know, aged care industry in Australia. We do have systems in place to ensure that we do uh, review and monitor the quality and care in our residential care facilities across Australia. Indeed, this specific issue that Senator Watt uh, is talking about is still under investigation. That is ongoing. So I will let that investigation proceed without further comment on those specifics. But I do want to remind the chamber that uh, our government is committed to looking after our aged citizens, uh, that every year under our government our home care packages have been increased, our residential care places are up, and every year we are providing more funding for our aged care system. We are delivering record investment across the aged care system and over the forward estimates, whereas under Labor um, we've increased it since when it was under what it was when it was under Labor, it is estimated that funding for aged care will grow to more than 27 billion by 2023 to 24. That is, on average, 1.5 billion of extra support for older Australians each year over the forward estimates. We are committed as a government to making improvements to the aged care for all senior Australians. And it continues to be one of our priority areas. That is why the Prime Minister called for the Royal Commission into the aged care quality and safety. And it is why we are acting on that. 
as Commissioner Briggs has stated as part of the final hearings of the Commission. And I quote, I have, however, detected over the last year, Council, a growing determination among officials and in the government to fix the problem of the aged care system and to pursue a genuine reform agenda. And we are committed to pursuing that genuine reform agenda. We will continue to focus on the gaps in aged care and we will continue to have our uh, aged care quality uh, commissioner undertake spot audits. Um, we will continue to have the commission review the performance of our aged care residential facilities and, where appropriate, to issue notices to impose sanctions and, where appropriate, if found, to actually revoke um, licences or the services accreditation. Um, those, however, those processes, we have them in place and they must be allowed to be undertaken without um, interference to ensure integrity in the system, to ensure that we don't have our system compromised by perception. And our government will continue to provide senior Australians with the support they need, but the best support of all is support that they can get in their own homes. And that is why we are committed to funding more home care packages. Our home care packages have increased from just over 60,000 under Labor. It's increased by 224 per cent. More Australians are getting care in their homes now than they did under Labor. And we continue to be committed to home care packages so that people can grow old with dignity, surrounded by their own family, in their own home, um, in a comfortable manner, with the necessary care and support they need to make their final years as comfortable as, pro as possible. But we will not turn our back on the challenges of the future, and we will continue to review and go through the Royal Commission's findings and implement reform where needed and where appropriate. Thank you, Senator Davey. Uh, Senator Polly. Tomorrow, the federal government will be handed the final report by the Royal Commission into aged care in this country. It will be the 22nd report in the last eight years that it's been presented to this government who will accept, quite frankly, no responsibility for the inept administration of the aged care sector in this country. Over the last eight years, yes, there has been additional funding put in, but when Mr Morrison was Treasurer, he used this sector as an ATM and gutted it by almost $2 billion. Now, we know that the interim report into um, aged care was handed to this government over 12 months ago. And what have we seen since then? Further neglect. Now, you would have thought that perhaps the title of their interim report, Neglect, might have given them a hint that they might have to do something sooner rather than later. But what they've done is they've just used the Royal Commission as an excuse not to take the courses of action that have been well documented and raised by, as I said, 21 inquiries and reports into the aged care sector. Now, they have known that the ACFI funding instrument has been broken for a considerable period of time and it needed to be fixed. They also know that there has been in excess of 100,000 older Australians who are still waiting on the aged care, uh, the home care waiting list for the level of care that they have been assessed as needing. We know that almost 30,000 30, older Australians have died waiting for that assessment level of care that they should have been receiving in their own home. We know that almost half of residential aged care older Australians in this country are malnourished. Only today 
we had aged care workers visiting Parliament House, talking to parliamentarians, including myself, hearing again, not that I hadn't heard this time and time and time again, of the difficulties that these workers are faced with every day, not having enough time to provide the care that older Australians deserve. Hearing about an old, older gentleman who fell and was left without adequate medical care for days with broken ribs. Broken ribs, can I say, having difficulty breathing. Now, this was happening because there wasn't enough time and enough workers to give this gentleman the care that he needed. He died. He died. That could have been prevented. Now, this government and this minister comes into this chamber day after day when we're asking questions, and he accepts no responsibility for the failings. The reason we had a Royal Commission called in the first place was because of this government and the previous Liberal governments over the last eight years have failed older Australians. They've failed older Australians and their families, and they've failed those workers in the aged care sector day in, day out. Now, we know that there needs to be more money put into aged care, but it's got to be done properly. There has to be transparency. You can't be spending these billions and billions of dollars year in, year out without knowing that the older Australians are getting the care, the dignity and the respect that they deserve in this country. We hear time and time again what a rich nation that we have, and we, we respect our senior Australians. That's what the minister says, and yet we're hearing case after case of neglect in this country. Another story shared with me this morning as a woman who was 200 kilos in her residential home, they didn't have a lift that was able to help the staff. So when she collapsed, and in fact, when she died in the hallway in that home where all the other residents could see her, they had no equipment to ensure that dignity and respect was shown to this woman so that they could return her 20 metres to her own bed so they could prepare her. That is a disgrace. It's a national disgrace. And it's unfair that Australian workers in the aged care sector are put in this situation you, day Polly. after Your day after day. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. And let me just say from the outset that the Morrison government is committed to ensuring a high quality of aged care for all senior Australians. Um, however, I refute the argument, uh, particularly from Senator Watt, that the Minister Colbeck is the only person who can fix the problems uh, with, a, with the aged care sector. There are a, the aged care sector has thousands of employees, and it is up to all of us um, to make sure that we carry out our fiduciary duties and to actually lay the blame solely at Minister Colbeck's feet is just typical Labor smearing. Uh, they themselves haven't got a policy or released a policy on what their so-called solutions are. They'd rather sit there and throw dirt day in, day out, attack the individual, rather than address the crux of the matter. Uh, and it should be noted that the Morrison Commonwealth Government has made improvements uh, to aged care for all senior Australians. And it's why the act, and, the, and it's you know the it's the re, you know, the reason why the prime minister actually called a royal commission into the aged care was so that we could actually find the right solutions and we were totally open and transparent about it. Now, Labor Party didn't call a royal commission into the aged care sector. They're not interested in actually finding solutions. They're only interested in looking at the problems and then laying blame at at the uh, minister Colbeck's feet rather than actually delivering real substantial outcomes real substantial outcomes and it's worth noting that the coalition government is actually delivering record investment across the aged care system and since 2012-13 uh, we've invested over 13.3 billion dollars uh, sorry 21.3 billion dollars in 2020 year ending 20 up from 13.33 billion dollars 
since the last Labor government. So that's an increase of about 50 per cent in the seven years of the coalition government, uh, or works out an extra about $1.5 billion every year uh, in extra support for senior Australians. Uh, we've also invested in additional home care packages. Uh, we've announced a record $5.5 billion for an additional 83,000 home care packages since the 2018-19 budget. So in the last two years, we've uh, added another 83,000 additional home care packages. Uh, and overall, there is now almost 200,000 packages uh, that have been fully funded, and that compares to just 60,000 when Labor will last in government. So I just, you know, it's worth thinking about that. We have increased by 300 per cent the number of home care packages available to senior Australians on top of the extra 50 per cent or $7 billion invested into aged care homes. Uh, importantly, around 99 per cent of senior Australians waiting for a package at their assessed level have also been offered support from the government, including an interim package uh, of a Commonwealth Home Support Program. And of course, it should also be noted that they continue to have access to our world-class healthcare system, which has done a, a fantastic job in the last 12 months uh, at supporting uh, our seniors uh, throughout the COVID crisis. Um, we believe the coalition, the Mor Morrison coalition government, believes in a strong aged care sector with a high quality and skilled workforce that will provide senior Australians with the care they rightly deserve and give all Australians confidence that our elderly are cared for with kindness, respect and dignity. The government so far has acted on the, its interim and COVID-19 reports and will carefully uh, consider final recommendations when they are handed down later this month. And obviously, we will also take uh, very seriously and seek to act upon the advice from the Royal Commission. Making improvements to aged care is actually one of the Morrison government's key priorities. As, as Commissioner Briggs of the Royal Commission stated as a final, as a final part of the hearings in the Commission, um, he has detected a number of problems in the aged care system and is determined to pursue a genuine reform agenda. And so just I'll complete I'll finalise this again. We, the Morrison government, are committed to providing senior Australians with the utmost high Thank quality you, Senator aged Reddick, care. Your time Sir. has expired. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. My mum spent the last five months of her life in aged care in northwest Tasmania. She loved it. Once she moved in, she repeatedly said that she wished she had made the decision to move into care earlier. She loved the company, the activities, the clean modern room and the staff. As the Aged Care Royal Commission looks deeply at issues in aged care and more and more families and aged care staff find their voices describing the horror of witnessing their most vulnerable loved ones mistreated, neglected and abused, I've realised that my mum won the lottery a lottery with increasingly uh, lengthening odds. During this pandemic, we have witnessed a system unable to respond, terrified residents, traumatised families, overburdened staff and appalling lack of resources that they need to take care of our vulnerable older Australians. An aged care so riddled with flaws and a lack of appropriate support that it simply could not move fast enough to protect life. An aged care system that is the responsibility of this federal government, a responsibility the Mo Morrison government and a minister who sits in this chamber has run from, hiding from, ducking and weaving, causing trauma and costing lives. We've heard so many voices and so many horrific stories of neglect. In the news today, a woman described the appalling neglect of her father, saying, they were treating my dad like an animal to be slaughtered, burnt, stepped on and left in bed to rot. The degrading treatment, the lack of respect, the disregard for the most basic of human rights needs and horrifies us all. It's a disgrace. And yet we've got a government and a minister for senior Australians and aged care services 
that shows no shame and no humility. This government has, has abrogated its responsibility to older Australians and their families time and time again. Today the, the country is bracing itself for the final report of the Aged Care Royal Commission due tomorrow. We've already seen its interim report titled Neglect. That says it all. <clears throat> a report that found aged care residents literally starving, with maggots in their wounds, and what workers in aged care and good providers, and I quote, succeeding despite the aged care system. Aged care should not be some kind of lottery. It is outrageous that it's become so, and yet that is exactly what this government has turned it into. Make such, making such a fundamental decision as moving into aged care should not be wrapped in terror and you will be subject to neglect and abuse. Many older Australians are genuinely, genuinely afraid and so are those who love them. Aged care workers are exhausted and stretched to their absolute limit. Older Australians built this country. They and the families who love them deserve so much better than the chaotic, unsafe system that has evolved under the Morrison government and this minister in this chamber. And here we have this minister constantly expressing concern with a furrowed brow and taking no responsibility for the wreckage that, that his government has brought. Let us never, ever forget that this crisis is this government's doing, a direct result of seven years of neglect. Seven years of neglect. A government that has made savage cuts in aged care, and I heard Senator Polly earlier talking about this, like the $1.7 billion in funding that was cut in 2016-17 and 2017-18, on top of scrapping the pay rise that staff had secured back in 2014. The truth is this government only called the Royal Commission because it was shamed into it by the Four Corners media scandal. That's the only reason we've got a Royal Commission. If that Four Corners story had not have run, we would not have had the Royal Commission that would have uh, shone a light on all this neglect that we are seeing. And they've had seven years. The Morrison government have had seven years to address this properly and to look after our older Australians. They've failed 21, 21 major reports into aged care during that seven years. They've received those reports during their seven years and they've failed to act on them. And we completely continue to see the sheer gall of this government that won't face up to its responsibility and they show no respect for our elderly Australians. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. I move that the Senate take note of Senator Birmingham's response to my question and Senator Payne's response to Senator Rice's question. The Minister's answer to my very, very clear question, why hasn't the PM had anything to say on an Aboriginal woman and her baby being attacked by a Nazi with a flamethrower this week? The silence from the so-called leader of this country is violence by saying nothing at all. He's saying it's okay that these racially motivated terrorist attacks are okay. ASIO, this country's very own spy agency, has said that the far-right extremism is growing in this country and that it is a threat. And what does the PM do? Nothing. When Labor senators in this place tried to get a motion through this chamber about a significant rise in far-right extremism, those opposite deleted all references to it. Why? Because those opposite are responsible for this, either because of what they say or because of what they don't say. The Prime Minister was today the guest of honour celebrating International Women's Day in this place. That in itself is a joke. But he was standing in the Great Hall saying that women should be protected. And he's right. We do need to be protected. Protected from the Liberal Party. The leader of this government 
must be some kind of magical being. He has this ability to just vanish or just simply knows nothing. Or he has something, nothing to say when the country needs him most. Maybe someone should tell him the reason why the limousine picks him up every day is because he's meant to be the prime minister. Do your job. Grow a spine. Condemn racism every single time. Otherwise, you are condoning it. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Senator Wright. Thank you. Minister Payne's response to my question about justice for Julian Assange, to be taking action to free Julian Assange, taking action to reach out to her US counterpart in the incoming Biden administration, was distressing. It was the same old, same old. Basically, complete abrogation of the responsibility, you would think, of this government to actually be protecting the rights of a US citizen. Julian Assange is in prison in the UK at the moment as a political prisoner. He is there because of a political decision by the Trump administration to charge him with espionage. It is a political action that was taken then, and it is a political action that needs to be taken by our government to be protecting his rights. And yet, when I asked, would she pick up the phone? Would she pick up the phone so that Julian Assange could be freed from the awful conditions that he is still experiencing in the Belmarsh prison in the UK? Her answer was that I haven't yet met with my counterpart, Anthony Blinken, but I'm sure that in the course of a meeting, this matter would be raised. I mean, this is appalling. There is no urgency there. There is no commitment. There is a willingness to just let Julian Assange continue to suffer in jail, basically shrugging her shoulders at the potential of the US appealing the court judgment that basically that said he shouldn't be extradited, but it's shrugging her shoulders at the potential of the appeal winning, at the potential of Julian facing up to 175 years in jail, of the year, uh, jail in the US. There is no recognition by this government of the political nature of the charges against Assange and no willing to, willingness to use the power that, as foreign minister, she has to, to engage on a political level. I mean, this decision to charge Julian Assange by the Trump administration was because he was a whistleblower, because he published evidence of war crimes. He revealed the murder of innocent men, women and children, crimes which the US Defence Force had covered up. Yet our Australian government has abandoned him. Look, the US, they are meant to be our mates. You would think that if you had an Australian citizen that is being held as a political prisoner, the least this government could do would be to use their power to reach out to attempt to free Julian Assange. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Thorpe, to take note of various answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say 